meeting is being recorded. And now that that is out of the way, good evening. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for our conversation with Squish, the St. Louis Queer Plus Support Helpline. Before I introduce Luca and Cleo, I just wanna take a moment to remind you all to please keep your microphone on mute. But if you have a question that comes up right away, please use the chat feature. Type it on in. Luca and Cleo will get to you as many questions as possible. And please feel free to ask questions if you've got them. We are a fairly intimate group, so it may be that we could come off mute and chat that way. We'll just play, play it by ear and see how it goes. So with that being said, let me take a moment to introduce Luca. Luca, they, them, a transmasculine, pansexual, Singaporean immigrant, co-founded Squish to create a resource they wish they had. As Squish's incoming executive director, Luca oversees program activities and develops Squish's training and education program. With 12 plus years of background in organizing and 300 plus hours of experience in learning and teaching peer counseling, they effectively lead and facilitate Squish's educational programming. Thank you for joining us, Luca. Cleo, they, them, is a transmasculine, non-binary, bi and asexual amateur painter. As training coordinator, Cleo organizes and teaches Squish's peer support educational programs for Helpline volunteers and community members. As a college dropout with ADHD, they are dedicated to creating learning environments accessible to those neglected by traditional education. Thank you, Cleo, for joining us tonight. So before I turn the microphone over, let me just mute myself. Thank you, Erica. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here today. As Erica mentioned, my name is Luca, although that resume slash bio seems kind of like, it feels like I wrote it 20 years ago, but really appreciate the introduction, Erica. Um, before we get started, I would love for folks, since as Erica said, it's a small group, if folks would, wouldn't mind introduce your name, your pronouns, if you feel comfortable with that, and also um, what brought you here to today's session. Um, I wonder if Becky, would you mind getting us started? And then we'll go to Sean and then Ethan and then Owen. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Becky, um, she, her pronouns. Um, I also work for the library. I am in teen services uh, coordination. And so we're always looking to make sure that we're being um, as welcoming and inclusive in our programs for teens. And so wanted to kind of check this out and see, uh, yeah, if I could learn something from it for our programs. Love that. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Sean, would you like to go next and Ethan? Sure. Uh, Sean Cochran. Um, I am here basically, I'm a he, he, I assume. I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the pronouns correctly, but I'm he, he. Um, one of the things that I guess intrigued me was um, the youth part. I have a lot of nieces and nephews right now that are going through their formative years and I just want them to you know be able to be comfortable and approach me and me you know um, say the right things to them and stuff and um, also the other thing is I think some people think now um, you know coming out and everything is so simple for people um, it's yes it's more accepted but there's still a lot more that comes with it that people don't understand so um, I think that's important for you know people to know about too. Definitely. Sean, I appreciate you showing up as a supportive adult for the for the younger people in your life. That's really Thanks. cool. Ethan, do you want to go next? And then Owen? Yeah, I'll go. Hey, my name is Ethan. I'm a 22-year-old white guy. So um, this is one of the mills I come. I identify as he, him. I'm cisgender. Uh, I'm here because I want to learn more about uh, what Squish is. I think it's a really interesting group. And I have a lot of friends who are LGBTQ plus, and I would love to be supportive of them and just learn more about this in any way I can. So I, I think what you guys are doing are great. And uh, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, Ethan. Definitely appreciate sorry. allies showing up for their friends. Sorry, go ahead, Owen. Um, sorry, I was like um, leaving another meeting that went late, um, went long. Um, what was my answer? <laughs> um, no worries. We're just doing name pronouns and what brought you here today. Uh, my name's Owen, he, him, his pronouns. And then um, uh, this is a 
like I'm saying this because like I had a class that wants us to go to different events, but also like I'm really interested in like the the helpline itself. And like I don't know if you know Uncle Joe's, but like it's like similar, and I really enjoy Uncle Joe's. I feel like this would be pretty cool to learn about, and maybe even join later on. Thank you, Owen. That's really cool to hear about. So for folks who don't know, Uncle Joe's is a peer counseling group on a college campus here locally. So I think um, the connection to what Squish does in terms of peer counseling is definitely on point. So thanks for introducing yourself, everyone. Cleo, can we start screen sharing? Okay, thank you, Cleo. So we are here today to start a discussion about um, queer terminology, queer mental health, and the power of peer support. Um, I just want to check the temperature of the room. Who here has heard of the term queer before? I'm wondering if um, anyone can maybe throw out a definition about it or um, where you first heard the word queer. And there are no, there are no wrong answers. Anyone can jump in. Uh, I first heard it in negative connotations, you know, when I was in high school smear the queer you know stuff like that yeah, it's not a positive it, word from when from when i was growing up absolutely it's definitely a word with a very hurtful and damaging history uh, we introduced it as in the name of our organization because we want to reclaim the word as a word that describes the LGBTQIA plus community. So here today, we'll tell you a little bit more about the history of the word, other LGBTQ terminology, um, needs of the community in St. Louis, as well as the power of peer support, peer counseling, and how that has changed our lives for me and Cleo. Let's go to the next slide, Cleo. Um, if you want to take a moment to sign into this presentation, we invite you to do so. We'll drop the link in the chat. Um, this gives you a chance to sign in and also subscribe to our newsletter if you want to, um, as well as get updates from the organization. Cleo, next slide, please. Today, we'll be covering LGBTQI terminology, how Squish was founded, why we even exist in the first place, and what, what is the work that we do. Um, a lot of us, y'all, I heard, are here to better support the LGBTQ people in your life, whether that's your work, your family, or your community. So we'll tell you a little bit about Squish's peer support helpline, how you can offer that as a resource to others, as well as what's in Squish's helpline training curriculum, what are our helpline volunteers equipped to do on the helpline, and what training do they go through? What are some ways you can partner or support Squish's work? upcoming Squish projects and events. And finally, contact information, a time for questions. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. And folks are always welcome to participate. We wanna make this as interactive and engaging as possible. Next slide, please. So we'll start first with some LGBTQIA terminology. So handing it to you, Cleo. Yes, absolutely. So uh, before we get into the terminology, um, we're not going to cover the acronym here, but I was wondering um, if anyone in the room has the, yes, the identities that the letters stand for. There's got to be a more concise term for that. <laughs> so uh, can anyone give the identities that the LGBTQIA plus stand for? Even if you just know a couple. So I think I've got lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer. I'm unfamiliar with I and A. All right. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone, I see, Sean, you are unmuted. Do you know the I and A? Uh, I don't. I was wondering if the Q was queer or questioning. Great question. I was about to address that. Yeah, it's both. Um, a lot of these these letters um, do some heavy lifting in terms of having like multiple identities. And yes, queer and questioning. Um, I'm gonna guess. Both, yeah, I'm gonna guess the A is asexual. Awesome. Yes. And the I is. I, I don't know. Independent and. In, uh, <laughs> in I don't know. <laughs> That's a good guess. Yes, absolutely. The A is for asexual or aromantic. Um, asexual being someone who experiences little to no sexual attraction. Roman aromantic being someone who experiences little to no romantic attraction. Does anyone know the I? Owen wrote in the chat, intersex. Owen, do you want to say more? Um, I don't know. This is what I associate with the I. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely right. Yeah, great guess. Oh, and back to you, Cleo. Yes, absolutely. Oh, am I frozen? Yes. Uh, I being intersex, um, an intersex, uh, someone who is intersex is someone who has sexual characteristics that don't neatly fit into what we consider uh, female or male um, characteristics. This could be uh, differences in chromosomes, um, levels of hormones, um, physical like parts, um, like primary or secondary sex characteristics. Cool. Thank you all so much for that. Now into a little bit more, some terminology that's not part of the acronym. Well, transgender is, uh, but we wanted to go into a little bit more depth about this one. So transgender is an umbrella term uh, for people whose gender identity or expression is different from cultural expectations based on the gender they were assigned at birth. So being transgender doesn't imply any specific sexual orientation. So transgender being separate from sexuality, transgender people can be straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual. Um, for example, Luca and I are trans, but I identify as bisexual, Luca identifies as pansexual. Cool. And cisgender uh, is a term used to describe a person whose identity aligns with the gender that was assigned to them at birth. So someone who is not transgender. And then gender dysphoria, um, significant distress caused um, when a person's assigned uh, birth gender is not the same as the one which they identify. Has anyone heard of this term before? I saw two nods from one from Erica, one from Becky. Yeah, I saw a head shake from Sean. Yeah, would y'all um, like to share the context or any like additional flavor you can add to this? Erica says it comes up in the news a bit. Ethan says, I have, normally as a precursor to identity change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, particularly as a precursor when talking about um, identity change, I think isn't the clearest way to put it, but like transition. Um, so for example, I experienced gender dysphoria, which is why in 15 days, very exciting for me, um, I am getting a chest masculinizing surgery, um, which is, yeah, very exciting. So gender dysphoria can be a whole range of things. Um, it could be physical. So for me, I'm like, mm, this part of my body feels very disconnected to me, and it is actually very distressing for me. It could be also social dysphoria, or I... Uh, that being the way society perceives me and treats me um, is very separate from the way that I would like to be perceived and treated. Um, or it could be, hold on, physical, social. There's got to be another one. Luca, am I missing one? Mm. That's okay. Like cultural, medical, perhaps. Yeah, that's all to say there are different ways that gender affects our lives and different ways that dysphoria manifests. But significant distress being, you know, for me personally, I'm like, this does not even feel like part of my body. This feels very separate. Um, and yeah. I'll share here too how dysphoria manifests for me. And then I would love to hear maybe Erica if you want to share a bit about how it comes up in the news. Um, so for me, I would just remember having vivid memories of being chased around the house by my parents who wanted to force me to wear a dress. Um, I think when I was younger, I was labeled as a tomboy a lot. And so not to say that everyone who's labeled as a tomboy is trans, but I think I lived in a world back then where there were no terms to describe the feelings I was feeling. And so I thought I was an alien. I thought I was adopted. I thought I was like, surely nobody else felt any of these feelings or felt displaced in my own body. When I read books, I always identified with the masculine characters. When I played video games, I always chose the masculine characters. Um, when I did anything role-playing or, or like any kind of theater, I always wanted it was drawn to the masculine characters. Um, there are a lot of different explanations about why people are trans and how um, being trans affects our experiences. But uh, I'm very grateful for the term itself because without it, I wouldn't know that other trans people exist. Um, I would love to hear from Erica how maybe gender dysphoria comes up in the news. Okay, sure. So the most recent story um, was a politician in one of the upper northern states who has a daughter, I believe, who um, at a young age expressed that she was no longer comfortable in the skin that she was in. She didn't feel comfortable as a girl. She felt more comfortable as a young boy. And so uh, she faced a lot of 
leading up to the story was the fact that she faced so much pushback from the general neighborhood and the public when they found out that she was supportive of these changes that her daughter wanted, her son wanted to make. Those are the kinds of things I hear about in the news. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hearing, I think you're right that a lot of the ways this comes up in the news is related to transition. Um, and I think, yeah, in the news talking about transition services, especially for kids, I've been seeing come up a lot. Um, transition services being ways to alleviate gender dysphoria. So for me, surgery um, or people going on hormones. Um, Erica, I also really appreciate the way that you corrected your language. I think a lot of times folks will identify trans people as what they knew them as before or what it says on their birth certificate, um, but saying like this person's son because that's how they choose to identify and not what they were before. So yeah, I appreciate that. Cool, thank you. So non-binary, another term that is not in the acronym, but I think is um, becoming very common. Uh, it's an adjective describing a person who uh, does not identify exclusively as a man or a woman. Oops. Could be someone who identifies as both a man and a woman, neither, somewhere in between, or falling completely outside of these categories. I say it's popping up a lot, not because more people are non-binary, but because this is a term that's been very normalized, uh, thankfully. Has anyone heard of this term before? Have any flavor text to add? Becky, I'm wondering if you want to share how you heard of it. Uh, I just have friends and coworkers that identify as non-binary, so. Yeah, absolutely. I identify as non-binary as well. Um, yeah, I think non-binary is a very fun identity because it can encapsulate a lot of different things. I don't think I've met two people um, who, who identify as non-binary who identify as exactly the same non-binary. Um, it's a wide range of gender identities and a very expansive and, yeah, inclusive one. If I and could then, uh, chime in on yeah. the term non-binary, yeah. I first heard it when uh, gender was described to me as a spectrum as opposed to, yeah. uh, as opposed to a, like a binary system of black and white or one and zero. And that's what really helped me understand what um, that uh, what being transgender is, is that, or the, the concept of gender being um, not necessarily one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for putting it in that context. Yeah, we think about gender as being binary, a one, a zero, man or woman. And so to bring it up as non-binary, all of the genders outside of those two specific points. Absolutely, thank you so much. And then queer, which Luca talked about a little bit earlier, a term used uh, often to express a spectrum of identities and orientations that are counter to the mainstream. Um, it was previously a slur, as we talked about, but was reclaimed by many parts of the LGBTQ movement. Um, we use it in our helpline because, uh, first of all, SQUISH, S-Q-S-H, we think is a very cute uh, acronym, uh, but also because it's generally very inclusive. Um, there's only so many letters that we can put in the acronym and inevitably folks are going to be left out. So to have this umbrella term of queerness um, is something that we, we want to make our line as inclusive as possible, which is why we use this language. Cool. Okay. Um, any other language, Luca, that you would like to bring up? Any thoughts, questions about the language we've covered before we move on? Stack some questions. Um, I just dropped the uh, human rights campaigns glossary of terms in the chat in case mm -hmm. anyone's interested in additional education. I also know that sometimes terms can feel a little disconnected from people's real experiences. So I want to pause you for any questions, comments. Um, there are no dumb questions, nothing that is uh, not worth asking. So anyone can jump in here with questions. I do, I do have a question. I, I ran, what is the etiquette for asking people these types of things i was in i was in two situations real recently where i mean i couldn't tell if i was dealing with a guy or girl and i so i didn't know how to address them is it mm. is it is etiquettely is it etiquette wise is it okay to say how do you um you know uh, yeah. what are your pronouns or what i mean or do i even <laughs> yeah how would i address them like, yeah, like, absolutely. Say ma'am or sir, but <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're spot on asking what people's pronouns are. Um, it can definitely be confusing when you're not sure, like, if someone is particularly androgynous. And I'm glad the question that came to mind is 
what pronouns do you use? How can I address you? Because um, I think if someone asks me, are you a man or a woman? Or what's your gender identity? Well, first of all, well, I'm not a man or a woman. Um, second of all, well, that feels a little intrusive. Um, so asking people, I, like the basic of your question is, I, I would like to refer to you respectfully. So asking like, how can I refer to you? What are your, what's your name and pronouns? Um, I think is a great way to go about it. Okay. Yeah. Sean, that's a great question. Um, on our helpline, when people first call in, we ask, how can I address you? So that seems like a good open and a catch-all. Um, I think also introducing your own pronouns can also normalize uh, the use of pronouns. So something Isla might do is say, I'm Luca, I use they, them pronouns. Um, what do you go by or what pronouns do you use? Does that help at all, Sean? So if I were to address you in public, how would I say that then? Would I, I, I don't, even if I knew your pronouns, am I saying, sir? Yeah, there are not many gender neutral replacements for words like sir or ma'am, mister or miss. I see Becky, you have your hand up. Do you want to chime in? I had a similar kind of question that, or discussion topic, so. I also I, saw, oh, go ahead, Becky. I was going to say, I can wait till, or. And Erica, I saw you unmute also. Did you have thoughts? Oh, Erica, you're muted. Uh, yes, I just want to say I think it's a great conversation to have. This is a fantastic question. I think there are a lot of people who are a little uncomfortable sometimes, and you know, maybe being uncomfortable is okay too. Yeah, I will Erica. admit. Oh. Go ahead, Claire. Yeah, I will admit even I am uncomfortable asking people their name and pronouns sometimes. Um, it can be like a difficult, uh, unexpectedly vulnerable conversation. Nuka, what were you going to say? Um, I have been sir, called sir and ma'am on the same day, uh, sometimes in the same setting. And I think um, personally how I wish the situation was handled was, was if someone just asked, you know, how should I refer to you? Um, there's an alternative to Mr. and Miss now called Mix, M-X, that is a gender neutral alternative. Um, and sometimes I think when neither so or ma'am seem appropriate, um, I usually use someone's name or if they have some other title, I use that title. But there's no currently good al gender neutral alternative to sir or ma'am, I think. Um, Becky, what do you think? Yeah, I've um, kind of in the similar vein of conversation I've had um, personally when I refer to someone who I don't know and haven't asked their pronouns, like maybe I know them adjacently from a friend or a coworker, I typically use they, them as my default, but I also don't know if that's, you know, because if that's not their pronoun either, um, yeah, so I try and use an individual's name, but then sometimes in conversation, it just comes out as they, them. So I was curious, yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think using they um, until you have more information is perfectly fine. And I do this the same thing. Um, and then making sure afterwards, once you do know someone's pronouns um, and their name and how they like to be addressed, making sure to use that language instead. Um, hold on, I had one more thought that I would like to address, but I have lost it. About hey, any... sir, ma'am, Mr. Oh, yes, about sir and ma'am. Yes. Um, so to answer the question generally, I think a lot of thought, like uh, questions that are coming up are along this, like a similar vein, which is um, avoid using gendered language unless you know that someone is comfortable with it. I personally hate being ma'amed in public. Um, <laughs> it makes me very uncomfortable, but I recognize that there aren't a lot of, you know, if someone is trying to say, excuse me, uh, and they like, sir or ma'am. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of good alternatives. So, you know, finding ways that we can take gender out of the equation. So just saying, oh, excuse me, um, or say, instead of saying ladies and gentlemen, saying everybody or, you know, folks uh, instead of you guys. As much as possible, noticing when we use gendered language and how we can remove gender from the equation completely. Cool. Owen has a great question in the chat. Um, can you explain gender versus sex? I've always been taught gender goes along the lines of man, woman, not binary, and sex goes along the lines of male, female, and intersex. But every time I see a form, it seems to use male, female for gender identity. So doesn't that conflict? 
Yes. Yes, this is a very um, difficult, I think, and like complex topic. I'm gonna try and make it not complex. Okay. So gender is the physical is the societal role in society, and sex is the physical. So uh, gender, you're right that genders that exist are uh, man, woman, non-binary. There are even some um, other terms that folks use. Sometimes I use gender queer. Um, there is an identity that Native folks use that is two spirit. Um, so it is gender is the societal role and way that someone identifies. Sex is a person's body and physical characteristics. Sex people also often say that gender is a societal construct, um, meaning that it exists just because of society. Um, sex is as well. Sex is the physical traits that we group together. And the groupings that we have right now are male and female. So the groupings are, you know, based on levels of estrogen and testosterone, um, primary and secondary, like sex tissue. So like breasts, genitalia, things like Adam's apples, um, height, um, where hair appears, body hair, balding. Those are all traits that we associate with sex in the physical body. Um, but they are not this immutable, um, like personally, I when people say that I am non-binary, but female in sex, um, I, I, my sex is not female. My sex, my uh, my sex, I, I have the body of a non-binary person, not a female. Um, and so acknowledging that these are just groupings that we came up with to make things easier to understand. And on, like, and on medical forms, folks often ask, assume gender and sex are the same thing, and then assume that they're going to get a specific amount of information from that. Um, often what they're asking is, what's your gender assigned at birth? It's kind of convoluted. Um, how did did that make sense or not make sense? Um, it, uh, I think it makes sense, but I'm just saying like, well, partially like for like, some people like a lot of like surveying stuff for like forms and stuff. Like mm -hmm. when it puts puts it the way it like, puts it like male, female is like gendered and like, is that just, should we just, is that wrong? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> well, that's what yes. I'm thinking. Because I feel like a lot of medical forms always say that. And I every time I see it, I'm just like, this, just, this doesn't seem right. Yeah, I think having uh, having at least more gender options list on check boxes for intake forms, or I think the best option is having people write in their gender altogether. And with medical forms, I think a lot of folks ask for the what is your sex or what is your like sex assigned at birth. Um, when I, the more inclusive way um, that folks can do that is asking for like just physical body care which I mentioned earlier. So instead of asking what's your like sex assigned at birth, because maybe the question is, do you need to go to a gynecologist um, or could you possibly be pregnant? Uh, if that's the information you're trying to get, asking that immediately. So on medical intake forms asking like, do you have, you know, uh, are you someone who'd like, do you have breast tissue that needs a breast exam? Do you have a uterus? Could you possibly be pregnant? Things like that. Okay, thank you. That was a great explanation about sex. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> And oh, and great question too. A lot of forms even now are still outdated. So conflating sex and gender, like you said. Um, yeah. And yeah, then Ethan thanks. says, would guys be a gender neutral term? I consider <laughs> it to be, but I could see how it could be seen otherwise. Yeah, we um, at Squish, we try to avoid using guys. I know we exist in the Midwest and that is often considered a gender neutral term, but a lot of folks are uncomfortable with it. So we try and replace it with folks, which I think we can get away with because we're a little Southern here um, or everybody. Um, I will admit in my personal group of friends, I know that we're all, all okay with guys. We are all the guys, so I still use it. But when you don't know if folks are comfortable with it, um, it we try to avoid using gendered terms because they might not be non-gendered to folks. You know, calling someone bro when they don't identify as a dude, even though to me, I'm like, yeah, I don't associate that with gender. Other people might. Great okay, points, Cleo. How will we feel about moving on? Can folks give a thumbs up if you feel comfortable moving on or let us know if you still have another question? Yeah, absolutely. And please put questions in the chat at any time or unmute. Um, I think answering questions like these is my favorite part of these and I think the most helpful. Okay, and now Luca, take it away. 
Thank you, Cleo. Um, now I want to tell people a little bit about Squish's founding mission and programs. Can I get a show of hands? Have you heard of Squish before this presentation? If you have, can you raise your hand? If not, can you maybe give a thumbs up? Okay, I'm seeing a few hands. Okay, all right. Um, a couple of us have not. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So who is Squish? Um, before I kind of share the story of Squish, I want to share my story as its co-founder. Um, I'm Erica introduced me as a transmasculine, genderqueer person born and raised in Singapore. Singapore is a really tiny country in Southeast Asia. It's also very conservative, and one of the laws passed down from British colonialism uh, criminalizes sex between men, um, and it's 377A, and it still exists till now. Um, in this really conservative, queerphobic environment, I grew up re feeling really isolated, stigmatized, and afraid. Um, most of the trauma in my life comes from hiding this identity from others in very precarious situations, uh, both socially and in terms of safety. Um, I never had any queer role models to look up to or supportive peers to talk to. And in middle school, when there was a rumor circulating that I might be bisexual, um, I was uh, like freaking out and denying it all the time and kind of walking on eggshells socially. Um, I think it's just one of the examples of um, queerness being a topic that is really taboo growing up. And I only found the courage to come out when I came to college in the US. Um, in St. Louis, I found a really vibrant queer and trans community. Um, the community here, even though it faces a lot of challenges, I think is also really resilient. And St. Louis is one of the most vibrant activist communities I've ever been a part of. So Squish is a resource I created that I wish I had growing up, which is a confidential, non-judgmental peer support resource and network that centers queer folks. And it's also important to me that Squish has the capacity to provide not just direct services, but use the helpline and resource referrals that we do to inform advocacy and education work towards systemic change. Because even if we took helpline calls for another 10 or 20 years, the levels of violence or discrimination might not change unless we use the work we do in providing services to inform social change. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'm going to ask if Cleo, you'd be willing to share your story on this next slide. I am muted, yes, happily. So hello, uh, my name is Cleo. I am genderqueer, also um, bi and asexual. Uh, I'm from Northeast Ohio. I moved to St. Louis back in 2019 um, after I had left school due to mental health and financial reasons. And my partner, who I met in college, moved down here. Um, I, back in Ohio, um, my parents got divorced early on because my mom um, is queer. And um, when they got a divorce, the, the fact that she was queer was used against her to argue that she was unfit to care for children and not mentally stable. Um, so I learned very early on that being a queer person and being an out queer person um, had negative consequences. So um, I didn't identify, I hadn't come out gender wise, but once my family found out that I was um, dating a girl throughout high school, I was kicked out of my house on my 18th birthday. So after I left college, I didn't exactly have anywhere to go. So I came back and moved with my partner here in St. Louis. Uh, so obviously I didn't know anyone besides my partner and their mom. Um, so I found Squish from a flyer um, in Shameless Grounds, if y'all are familiar with the kink-friendly coffee shop down in South City. Um, and I was just looking for a way to support folks to get connected with the queer community. So I signed on to go through our training course and become a helpline volunteer. Um, and the peer support skills that I learned in um, our 48-hour training course for you know, to take the line have really changed like my life and the way I communicate with others, and my relationships, and even the way I communicate with myself. Um, and it's really helped me build a support system outside of my family, which isn't something that I have. So um, my work here with Squish is I want to do the as best I can to educate folks so we can all support each other, um, especially, you know, for the queer folks who don't have the biological family support um, like many of us don't. Thank you for sharing, Cleo. That was really vulnerable. I wonder if folks have any questions for me or Cleo. Uh, we can take maybe one or two before we keep moving. Okay, then let's keep moving. Um, Cleo, next slide, please. So we know that my story and Cleo's story is 
Split, they're not unique, even though they're too unique to us. Um, the queer community in St. Louis faces higher rates of violence, discrimination, housing insecurity, and substance use, as well as medical, mental, and sexual health disparities. We also face additional barriers to accessing the identity affirming resources needed to meet those needs. So if you think about it, it's a bit of a catch-22 cycle where the disparities that we face are not being met um, or addressed by resources that exist, which then furthers those disparities and keep them in place. Next slide, please. We know that nationally, LGB youth are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide compared to heterosexual youth five times. It's a huge disparity there. And 40% of transgender adults report having attempted suicide. Again, 40% is a staggering statistic. Locally, at least two-thirds of the trans community in St. Louis do not have their mental health needs fully met. We're also he seeing here the application of intersectionality, so how people's social identities compound um, to create additional barriers or disparities. So, for example, seeing youth facing um, unique mental health concerns, transgender people, transgender adults, people living in St. Louis. One in seven LGBT Missourians reports experiencing discrimination in the workplace. And so that is why when people say, you know, it's 2022, um, this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. We know that it still does. We also know that 61.6% of Greater St. Louis respondents have experienced violence or victimization due to homophobia over their lifetime. Next slide, please, Cleo. Finally, we wanted to share that LGBTQ students in the South and Midwest had more negative school experiences overall than students in the North, East, and West. So we know that we face specific regional concerns as well, given the social political climate differences. And this includes higher rates of biased language, victimization, and anti-LGBTQ school policies. I'm gonna pause you and ask for people's reactions. Um, for example, I know Becky, you work with teens. I'm wondering if any of this resonates with you, um, anything stands out. Anyone can jump in. I mean, yeah, it definitely, unfortunately, resonates. Um, and we've seen a, a large like decline in teens coming into our spaces with COVID and all of that as well. But um, yeah, it's it's always. Uh, a concern and something that we try and um, acknowledge and find ways that we can be supportive of youth that are coming into our spaces. Um, and then especially uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being in the Midwest, uh, there's often times where uh, students we talk with or teens are uh, uncomfortable uh, selecting certain material because of what that might, um, what, um, their peers or their grownups or their teachers might um, think of that. So. so sharing Becky, that's really heartbreaking to hear. Does anyone want to respond to that or have thoughts on the community needs we just shared? I can add to that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky from St. Louis, and I can tell you that there is a scarcity I know yeah. my liberal art school has um, anonymous uh, support systems, but definitely not anything specific. Yeah, definitely. Um, Ethan, what was it like moving to rural Kentucky? Um, it was certainly a culture shock. Mm. Yeah. It's what a was little bit of the South. And the South. Even though it's... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry, is it, can you guys hear me okay? Your audio is cutting out a bit, so maybe try speaking directly into the mic, but for the most part, I can hear you. Shoot, okay. Um, <laughs> this, uh, well, one second, I have, I have that I need to grab, and um, uh, then I'll be right back. So you guys can move on. Someone else. Okay, we'll come back to you, Ethan. I see Lisa just joined us. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Um, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself, your name, pronouns, and why you joined us? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Lisa, and I am 
a colleague of Erica's at the library, and I uh, had just got off work, so I apologize for going late. And I'm going to be in transit, so I'm going to make my video go away to the extent that you can see me. Uh, but sorry, Lisa Thorpe, see her, hers. Uh, I work in the Social Science and Grants and Foundation room at the uh, Central Library. So uh, along with Erica and her collection, I've got a lot of the books on this subject. I also have a, my youngest uh, child who is 22 and is transitioning, so I'm learning about all kinds of stuff. Um, they did my nails yesterday, so that was lovely. And uh, yeah, I'm just here to learn stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And for those who are wondering, the slides and recording will be made available after the session as well. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So we know that these statistics are can be dry and maybe depersonalized. And so we want to flesh out what they mean through the voices and stories of Queer St. Louisans. The first is from Jamie Hauman at Trans Education Services. She says, only a local helpline would know who's culturally competent, like if the nearest ER is a Catholic institution with a poor track record for serving trans people. My close friend was counseling a trans person on the edge of suicide. When checking into a hospital, they were misgendered, dead named, and treated contemptuously. They attempted suicide two weeks later. Having trans and queer staffed helplines matter. So this is a really horrific story and um, being misgendered means to be referred to as a gender that you're not and to be dead name is to be referred to as a name that you're not. So for trans people, that's often maybe names they were assigned at birth or pre-transition names. Um, it might seem like a small thing and sometimes folks maybe even do it unintentionally, um, but often it accumulates over time to form a pattern that escalates into violence or creates a really large level of harm um, over time. Next slide, please. The second quote we have here is about housing. So Jordan Braxton at Pride St. Louis says, shelters are not culturally competent to handle trans people. They make you live with people based on your sex assigned at birth. Trans clients have to worry about untrained staff as well as people in the shelter. It feels unsafe. The trans queer flat is a great model, but we probably need five more. And to add some additional context, the trans queer flat has since closed down due to lack of capacity. And so now there are no trans specific or trans affirming housing options in St. Louis. Um, this is why Squish's work to educate staff at different housing providers is, becomes more critically important. Um, a lot of shelter staff, I think, are well-intentioned, but maybe see a trans person coming in and they think, oh, this is a man dressing up in women's clothes or, and so um, assign them to the men's section when that is probably not their preference. Shelters uh, often don't have non-gendered uh, infrastructure or housing or rooms, for example, um, and often folks who are unhoused don't have identification documents or don't have a way to advocate for themselves. Um, and so in a lot of these systemic ways, um, housing and shelters are not competent to house trans people safely. Next slide, please. This third call is about uh, trafficking and relationship violence from Cindy at Safe Connections. Cindy says, we received a call from a victim of trafficking who identified as a trans man, experienced stalking, whose intimate partner was abusive and exploitative, and whom law enforcement didn't want to help because of his identities. Shelters wouldn't accept him because they would ask about his biological genitalia. Because he looked male, he was described as not safe for others. Lack of shelter, lack of community support, being disbelieved and exploited by human trafficking, these barriers specific to his identity made him desperate for resources. I'm going to pause here and ask if people have any reflections on this quote. Um, maybe some thoughts about why, um, what were some of the factors that contributed him not having resources he needed? I think it's just lack of training for the people that he's speaking of here. Um, you know, them not being able to, they don't know the particular needs of the trans community and queer people. Absolutely, it's a lack of training, education, awareness, acceptance maybe. Yeah, compassion, you know, some, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's move to the next slide, Cleo. Finally, we have a last quote here from Nicole at Life Crisis Services, who says, 
At Life Crisis Services, we receive calls from callers who identify as transgender and specifically identify being transgender as the reason for their suicidal ideation. At the middle school I teach at, I see students struggling with their sexual orientation who need someone to talk to. Being able to connect them to a helpline specifically for LGBT college would be great. Despite the training, more general helplines may not be as supportive. Do people have any thoughts on that? Why is it that despite their training, more general resources may not be as supportive or helpful? One reason could be that um, in a lot of organizations that serve a more general community, serving the queer community is often a one hour module out of a 40 hour training, or it's just one identity in part of their overall cultural competency training. So often there's not a lot of focus or intention on this community specific needs. And that goes for a lot of other marginalized communities as well. Next slide, please, Cleo. So we just presented you with a lot of doom and gloom statistics. Um, we're gonna share here a little bit about what we're doing about them. We know that before Squish, no queer specific helpline staffed by trained peer counselors had existed in St. Louis, at least since the 1980s. Our philosophy is that every queer person deserves to be treated compassionately and to access the community resources we need to lead fulfilling lives. So this philosophy drives us every day. Next slide, please, Cleo. We also noticed there's some gaps in the service system. We know that national LGBTQ hotlines like the Travel Project and the Trans Lifeline exist. Has anyone heard of those before? Maybe raise your hand if you've heard of them. Okay, some nods. Yeah. So these are you know pretty well known national resources, um, but only a local helpline will be familiar with the St. Louis context, culturally competent local resources, and wraparound services that can holistically meet someone's needs. You heard in the quotes before that knowing about the local ER in which hospitals have trans-affirming procedures and intake forms, that made a difference to someone's life. Um, only a local helpline that's grassroots connected to local communities and kind of um, constantly aware of and responding to the local context can do that. Unlike traditional hotlines, Squish offers a range of emotional support services beyond crisis intervention. We call it also a warm line because people don't need to be in crisis to call. In fact, people, we welcome people to call if you're having a good day, a bad day, or a totally neutral day. Um, we know that peer support reduces loneliness, increases uh, crisis prevention, and people can call even if you feel like you're not on the brink of emotional breakdown, and that actually helps to prevent crisis later on. Next slide, please. Um, I think let's skip ahead to Squish's mission. So two slides later, Squish's mission is to strengthen the queer community in St. Louis metro area by providing three things. One, empathetic listening. Two, connections to identity for affirming resources. And three, education and advocacy for queer and trans needs. And you see the first two are more in the realm of direct services and the third is more in the realm of social change and systemic efforts. Next slide, please, Cleo. Um, you might be curious, what programs do we run? Uh, even though we're called a helpline, the helpline is actually only one of six programs that we do. The peer support helpline offers emotional support. Our resource database catalogs over a thousand St. Louis resources and connects people to resources, even if they can't call. Um, the call data analysis and advocacy program aggregates our call data findings and uses them to advocate for systemic change. For example, we get a lot of housing calls from trans people and we compile all of the call data related to housing to present to local housing providers about the specific barriers that trans people face. We provide training for partner organizations like this one, provide education for the queer community for skill building, and we engage over 60 volunteers in grassroots organizing so that we're bringing people together and building community. I've just taught a lot, uh, talked a lot at y'all, so I'm going to pause here for questions, comments, maybe anything you're wondering about Squish's programs or mission or history. Hey, is my mic uh, okay? Can you guys hear yes. me Yes, Ethan, yes. Hey, okay. Uh, I was just curious. Um, I see the systemic change line, so I wanted to kind of uh, get um, a little more information about uh, the kind of call for action, maybe that you guys have for um, either the local government in Missouri, or St. Louis, excuse me, and then um, maybe the state as a whole. Hmm. That's a great question, Ethan. I'm going to put this out to everyone, actually. So what are some advocacy recommendations? Um, when it comes to improving the lives of queer people in, 
in Missouri and Illinois. Um, one, I think, is the recent ban on trans athletes, so banning um, young trans athletes from participating in competitions, sports competitions, based on the gender they um, identify with. Um, these are really harmful policies. Um, many states around the country also don't ban conversion therapy. And we know that the majority of states that don't ban conversion therapy will have practitioners who do then recommend or force their clients to go to conversion therapy. Um, these are both very harmful practices that on the state level we can fight against. What about on a maybe day-to-day -day level? Cleo, any recommendations, thoughts? Well, I was just going to say, um, so less about like things that we would like to see from lawmakers, but more about the actions that we take. As a 501c3 nonprofit, we are not able to support specific candidates um, or lobby uh, or engage like that directly with the legal system. However, we work with uh, organizations like Promo Missouri, um, which advocate on behalf of queer folks um, who do get in contact with lawmakers who do lobby for queer folks. And we give them our call data that we have scrubbed and analyzed. Um, to help lobby for change, to tell lawmakers, here's what folks are generally getting calls about. Um, here's what is important, like, you know, X, Y, Z amount of the calls that Squish has taken um, have talked about housing instability. This is a really important thing. We need to be talking about this. This needs to be something that we are working towards. Um, so in terms of the like the the advocacy, um, I also think that this is advocacy talking with folks, y'all being here today, um, and you know all the the things that you are learning here and taking that with with you um, to make spaces safer for queer folks in your life. This is sort of like a micro level where you know policy is more macro level, but I think both are important. Absolutely, welcome back, Lisa. Um... I'm curious if other people have folks have thoughts about what we can do um, as people to advocate for the queer community. This could be in your own lives, in your own education, or in the spaces that you're in. I'm going to agree that it, it comes down to individual people. I mean, because if I'm sitting here watching this, to be honest with you, this is a lot of stuff I don't know about. You know, I am gay, but I don't, I'm not part of the trans community. And so this is one of the reasons I want to learn this. But, you know, the more the, I can learn this and then talk to people at work, you know, who then maybe look at it differently with their children or, you know, something to that effect. So I think the people involvement is very important. Absolutely. Also, thanks for sharing, Sean. Much appreciated. Let's keep moving. I would, um, oh, Ethan, just to quickly say something, I would also encourage you guys as you expand to um, uh, expand into uh, more states in the Midwest, such as Illinois and Indiana, because uh, it's uh, the lack of knowledge as well as uh, organizations such as this in, in the Midwest as a whole is, is really large. And uh, specifically Illinois, I think um, would be a great place to expand this outreach to it. And, and uh, I hope I don't sound uh, like I'm pressuring you guys into something, but I'm, I'm saying as you guys grow and expand. Definitely, Ethan, and you know, we wish we had the capacity to even expand nationwide. Every state, every city, every region could use a squish. Um, and yeah, definitely we are working, doing what we can to focus on St. Louis right now, but trying to create change nearby and elsewhere too. We know that a lot of areas don't have organizations like these. Yeah, I also would like to say, um, though, like community partnerships and things like this are, you know, they're so mm, there's a lot of organizations that we could partner with outside of St. Louis, but in terms of calling, anyone can call. We don't ask any intake questions. So folks outside of the St. Louis metro area can absolutely call. Erica says, what might be some good ways to address microaggressions? Good question. Anyone can jump in here. Um, some We actually have a cheat sheet of how to address microaggressions that maybe we can send out. Um, but some quick tips are um, you know, deciding how you want to intervene and support the person can look very 
can look different and really should center the person experiencing the microaggressions. It might be as simple as checking in with them afterwards. For example, hey, I noticed that um, our supervisor said something negative about queer, queer people just now. How are you feeling? Um, it, to something a little bit more involved, like saying, hey, I just noticed you said this thing which might um, you know, imply some bias towards this group of people. Um, can we check in and um, clarify what you meant. Um, so there are kind of different levels of how confrontational you want to be to how subtle you want to be, and we're happy to send the resource out to maybe Erica. Cleo, anything you want to add? Yes. Oh. Ms. Evans on the chat, um, I statements. I think when you're talking about harm done, putting it in the form of I statements. So if you, um, you know, especially if it's personal, if someone misgenders me, trying my best to say like, I was personally hurt when you used the wrong pronouns for me. Um, and instead of focusing on like an individual, um, focusing on the action or behavior, um, or, you know, simply saying like, you know, I think uh, misgendering and using the wrong pronouns are sort of the microaggressions that I face most frequently. So th things like stepping in and just saying like, actually, Luca uses the same pronouns. Um, <laughs> and just quick corrections like that. Or yeah, if there's like more harm being done using I statements and talking about the effects um, and the behavior and not the person, which I, yeah. Thank you, Cleo. Erica, great question. Let's keep moving. And so we're gonna give you some information about Squish's peer support helpline. So you have information you can share when making a referral. Next slide, Cleo. Um, Cleo, this is your section, so go for it. Awesome, yes. So uh, our helpline is open Fridays through Mondays, one to seven. Uh, we specifically chose weekend hours outside of traditional business hours. Um, and we would love to be able to open be open 24 seven, but with our volunteer capacity, we can stay open for Fridays through Mondays, one to seven. So uh, we have highly trained volunteers before taking calls. All of our volunteers undergo 48 hours or more of helpline training that cover an extensive range of issues, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, that LGBTQIA plus folks face. Um, and volunteers continue to train and refresh skills throughout the year. We uh, most recently had a training on how we can support um, queer immigrants, um, and we'll be doing a part two of that. We recently had Planned Parenthood come in and speak with us, so we make sure to continually re-up our skills. We are confidential, so volunteers will not disclose any information about a caller's identity or situation unless they are in immediate or severe danger, which it may not be maintained. Again, we don't ask any intake questions when folks call the line. So if someone says something, um, for example, um, I think a lot of lines would dispatch folks for, uh, if someone mentioned suicide. Um, if folks don't wanna give us any information about where they live, where they are, there's nothing that we can do to we have to maintain confidentiality because there's no information given and we intentionally keep it that way. So we're open to allies, friends, family members, service providers. Everyone is welcome to call, especially if you're looking to support the queer folks in your lives. If you're like, I'm looking for a resource um, or I wanted to talk through something that just happened and how I can best support this person. Uh, but also again, we don't ask any intake questions. So we're not gonna grill y'all if you call like, so are you queer? What do you identify as? Uh, we let folks start the call and talk about what they want to talk about. We have a single session policy. So each call is treated as an individual session. Um, so not a continuing service with, uh, with uh, cases um, or a case plan. Volunteers uh, will arrange referrals to outside resources if folks need ongoing mental health support. And we have vetted resources. Um, we have a resource book of over 1,200 resources, um, which we have moved from, or are in the process of moving from a Google spreadsheet to an actual database that is searchable and more accessible to the public, which we are very excited about. Um, all of our, most of our resources have been vetted by community partners like the Metro Trans Umbrella Group or Planned Parenthood. Um, and Yes, and we use this is accessible to the community, though right now it's a little bit more difficult to use, and it's what we use when finding resources on the line. And finally, I 
think finally, um, we look to be collar led. Our philosophy is that our collars are people that have life experience, opinions, and preferences that are to be honored. Volunteers, we, we work through issues at a caller's pace. Um, it's important as, um, thinking if I wanna ask a question, actually, I will just, yeah. <laughs> um, it's really important as queer folks often have, uh, we often face more barriers to things, um, more oppression. Um, we often have, our choices sort of taken away from us because of the systems that we exist in. So making sure that we can create a space where trans and queer people have the agency to do what they, to talk about what they would like, to process what they would like, to go where they would like when that might not be true in a lot of the spaces that they're in is one of our guiding philosophies. Luke, I saw you on mute for a second. No, you just said what I was gonna say, so. Awesome, cool. <laughs> I lied, that was not the last thing. Um, our volunteers take shifts in pairs, which is partially why our hours are relatively limited. For every three hour shift, at least two volunteers will be on, on that shift so that one can debrief, someone can search for things while the other person is speaking. Um, and so we can switch roles so no one takes more than one call on a shift. And we have a part of um, having to folks on the line is that we want to build up a support system for our volunteers. Luca mentioned that we have about over 60-ish uh, volunteers that we engage with our volunteer uh, engagement system program. Um, and we do our best to use our peer counseling skills internally and to create a supportive volunteer community, um, especially with compassion fatigue and burnout, um, vicarious trauma being such um, strong issues faced within all nonprofits, but especially um, in advocacy work uh, with queer folks and all identities. It's really important that we make sure we have spaces for folks to debrief. Um, we have helpline teams every team meetings every month, and we try to do our best to make this as successful as possible. So, giving our volunteers opportunities to earn academic credit, practicum hours, internship hours, and you can schedule calls. Um, to schedule a call, you can go to tinyurl.com slash squish call, where you can put in a time when you are available between you know, our open hours and folks will call you because often it can be difficult to pick up a phone and make that call yourself. Something in the chat. Thank you for putting that in the chat. So that's a little bit about our line. I wanted to ask, in what situations could you see yourself or someone in your life calling the line? I think because of my lack of knowledge in some of the terms and pronouns and um, transgenders stuff that I would definitely refer someone to something like this for people that have more experience. Yeah, absolutely. I'm honored that you would trust us with that. Thank you. Can I hear from maybe one more person? I had zero assumptions about Squish because I didn't know anything about Squish. <laughs> so I'm super excited to have learned as much as I just did. But I think I would encourage just about anyone that had questions or was in a situation that where they had questions or they needed some support to give you guys a call. Thank you. Awesome. I'm excited to hear that. So here's a little bit about how Squish as an organization is uh, structured. So we have our staff and board. We are not hierarchical organization. So as you can see, all of our um, teams are across the board uh, with our staff and board getting, you know, some sort of tendrils in a lot of our other teams. Um, but we have, conf we have a conflict support team, advisory team. Um, we have an internal and external steering team and then our helpline teams. Luca, I see you've unmuted. Yes, this is my section technically. Oh, Do you want to cool. I was to wondering, it? I felt like we had a tone shift, but I didn't see a change of slides. Awesome. Luca, go ahead. Yes. Uh, next slide, Cleo. So uh, this next slide is a page from our annual report from 2019 and 2020. It displays uh, some information about color demographics in terms of race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, sexual and romantic orientation. 
the main thing I want to point out is that there's a vast variety of, of uh, sexual, romantic orientation, and gender identities that people call in with, which I think really demonstrates that when we don't put boxes around people's identities, there's so many words they can use to self-describe. Um, so queer, non-binary, gender non-conforming folks are the uh, most highest, biggest demographic that calls in, followed by transmasculine, gender fluid, questioning, cisgender women, trans, trans women, cis men, cross-dressers, demigirls. Um, our age range ranges from 17 to 65, um, even though uh, on, on average, the median is 26.5, so on the younger side. And then in terms of racial and uh, ethnic demographics, 62% of our callers are white, 8% um, are Black or African American, 23% are Asian, Asian American or Pacific Islander, and 8% are Latine or Hispanic. And we're actively seeking to serve more Black, Brown, and other people of color and hoping to make our um, resources and programs more accessible to Black and Brown folks in the area, especially considering that at least 50% of St. Louis City is Black or African American. Next slide, please. Um, here's some more call data. So 79% of callers called on behalf of themselves, 16% called on behalf of someone else, which really is, illustrates that you can call for any reason, even if you're calling not for yourself, but for someone else or someone you care about. Um, in terms of reasons for calling, 71% of people called because they wanted emotional support and 29% for resource referrals. On the right-hand side, you'll see there's a wide range of call topics that people call about. Um, housing and mental health are the two biggest ones, but you also see a smattering of other topics like sexual health, substance use, queer identity, relationship health, coming out, suicide, self-harm, abuse, gender transition, education, race, physical health, religion, activism. Because we're a peer counseling line, there's no limit on what people can call about. And I think one of the biggest strengths of peer support is that unlike um, say a therapist, for example, where there might be a hierarchical relationship and you're talking to a professional. With peer counseling, um, it feels like the sky's the limit. You can talk about anything you wish to talk about. It doesn't have to be a problem you're trying to work through or something that is negative. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths of peer counseling as compared to crisis intervention. Next slide, Cleo. Uh, this is a slide with some information about our phone number, our website. Um, this is also available on our social media and our uh, main website. Next slide, Cleo. Um, this is our Facebook banner with some information about who we are, our operating hours, and when you can call. Next slide, Cleo. For folks who are wanting to impact the physical spaces you're in, um, we can share our flyers. They're also available on our website. So you might want to hang them up in your office, your workplace, your school, your libraries. Um, the left one is our general flyer, and the flyer on the right is our helpline flyer. Next slide. Finally, we have two quotes from our callers. When we ask them, what did you find most helpful when you called in a post-call feedback survey? This caller said, I found it really helpful to hear my peer counselor's validation from a place of personal experience, to hear them tap into experiences of their own marginalization that parallel my own story. Here we see how hearing about people's similar experiences can be really healing in and of itself, and how peer counselors break down the barriers between the person supporting and the person getting support. Um, Unlike therapists who don't put themselves in the session, peer counselors are more like friends and an empathetic listening ear, and their personal experiences are also informing the conversation. Next slide, please, Claire. This person says, as a queer and trans person of color, even when I'm seeking support, I constantly expect to have to educate and challenge people's assumptions in order for my feelings to make sense to them and for me to feel validated. During this call, I didn't have to explain the way I usually do. So here we see that um, having a helpline that's educated on racial issues, on queer issues, made a difference to this caller because they didn't have to explain the terms they were using, their lived experience, or the feelings they have. What do people think about these quotes? Any questions or reflections so far? I think they kind of capture the issues that I've uh, heard a lot of people that go through any uh, 
or any uh, person of this community uh, feels, especially their feelings not feeling validated or feeling like they have to explain themselves in a certain way that um, doesn't, doesn't, it's not exactly correct. It, it, I just love that you guys uh, don't challenge them on anything and you just accept who they are. And I think uh, a lot of people can, can benefit from just hearing that. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. I think you really pointed out the non-judgmental, empathetic listening that it's the core at the core of our peer counseling service. Um, other thoughts, questions. Okay, so if you're wondering what training do our volunteers go through, this next session uh, section will tell you. So, Cleo, maybe let's just spend five minutes on this, and then we can wrap up with Q and A and last slides. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into this, I will say if uh, this training curriculum seems interesting to you, we are recruiting for Healthline volunteers uh, to go through this training over the course of the summer. So consider this also a little bit of a pitch. As I mentioned, this is a training that I went through that, and this information and these skills radically changed my life. So um, we have two parts of our curriculum. We have our theory and knowledge, and we have our peer counseling skills. In terms of theory and knowledge, we cover, we start with radical forgiveness, which is an art therapy course um, about deconstructing bias and personal bias by the justice fleet. Um, we of course have LGBTQIA plus cultural humility. We have a section on anti-bias education and interrupting racism. Um, we talk about overdose education, uh, relationship and sexual violence, child sexual abuse. Um, and then we have a more lighthearted topic of queering sex and relationships, which expands the idea of what relationships can be. Of course, we talk about trans healthcare services, trauma-informed helpline practices, suicidal thoughts and behavior, and housing resources. Um, as Luca talked about on a previous slide, um, drug use, sexual violence, child sexual abuse, healthcare, transition services, suicide, and housing are all topics that come up relatively frequently on the call. And for our peer counseling skills, the skills that we use when it comes to you know, utilizing the information that we have, we have our active listening course, which is making callers feel heard, listened to, and seen in a metaphysical sense. So that is paraphrasing and summarizing, mirroring language and tone, open-ended questions, which I think is my favorite skill, ice statements, and then non-verbals. And then we move to empowerment skills, which is the skill to make folks feel uplifted um, and valued in their perspective and their experiences. So that is validating, normalizing, cheerleading, myth busting. Uh, and then we move into some more technical skills about how to take the line. So talking about call flow, how a call should move, um, what being caller led looks like. We mentioned that that's one of our key philosophies, um, check-ins, and then building rapport with callers. Uh, then we talk a little bit more about feelings-oriented calls and feelings, and then solution-oriented calls, which is safety planning, introducing resources, doing risk assessment for self-harm and suicide, and then grounding exercises. Cool. Within our training course, we do a lot of role plays where we um, role play what it is like to be on a call with the folks who are uh, going to take the line. So we make sure that folks are prepared uh, and have the practice to actually take the line without the possibility of causing harm to folks who are on the line. Cool. Any, yeah, I'm wondering what folks' thoughts on our curriculum is. Maybe one thought and then we'll move on. Intense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. As mentioned earlier, this is a 48 hour course and 48 hours feels like a long time until you're going through it and you realize it is very packed. Because it's in depth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We cover a lot. It's very thorough. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. We've been constantly trying to pare down our trainings, but all of these skills are so important. Um, I remember talking to Luca at the end of last year's training, thinking like, our, it should be longer. We need more time with these skills. And I found out that most helplines actually do maybe a quarter of this when it comes to training. So we want to make sure that our volunteers are as prepared as possible to take the line um, and that folks have as best of an experience as possible, which I think so far of everyone who's filled out a survey, they have said they have had a good experience. <laughs> so I, I think it's working. 
If there's nothing else, Luca, back to you. Thank you, Cleo. Um, I also wanted to add that to, to support volunteers going through this in-depth curriculum, we offer stipends and free counseling or therapy. So all helpline volunteers gain access to weekly or every other week free counseling or therapy starting from the time they volunteer until the end of their volunteering experience because we know that taking these calls and going through these training topics can be really mentally draining as well. Um, in terms of ways to support or partner with Squish, if you're getting tired, we are getting to the end of this pre presentation, don't worry. And we'll just wrap up with some ways that you can partner with us and support our work. Next slide, please. Um, the biggest thing that will be helpful is publicity. So spreading the word about our organization, the work that we do. Some specific ways might include including Squish in your resource list, displaying our flyers in your office, bulletin board, boosting our social media posts, checking out our website, encouraging your friends, family, coworkers, and peers to call Squish's helpline, especially helping us reach underserved communities in St. Louis. Other ways to support are donating to Squish or volunteering with Squish. So Erica had a great question in the chat about how to get involved. Um, on our website, there's a tab that's volunteer, get involved, volunteer. There are a lot of volunteer opportunities on there. Um, you can also direct other potential volunteers, interns or practicum students, donors and funders to Squish, or connect us with other community partners, training providers, guest speakers, or grant opportunities. If there's a voice in your head going, oh, it'd be great if Squish know them, knows them or connected with them, then that's a great sign to connect us with them. Next slide, please. Some of our most needed volunteer positions include helpline volunteer. Um, so you would go to the 48 hour helpline training and take one year of shift on the helpline. If that sounds too intense for you, or if you want to focus on something more narrow or skills based, we're also looking for folks to help with program evaluation, fundraising, database uh, migration, so you'll help out with the Squishbook resource guide, press and media work, graphic design, web development, IT support, or conflict support. Next slide, please. We take applications for these volunteer positions year round with the exception of the helpline volunteer because there's a specific training cycle. So this cycle, volunteer applications are open for the helpline team. Joining a grassroots network of queer for me peer counselors is a radical form of mutual aid, um, especially amidst the pandemic. If you apply to train and serve on our helpline, um, we encourage you to apply by March 26, which is the early bird deadline, or the general deadline of April 23rd, which is when all helpline volunteer applications close. And the link is tinyurl.com slash squish apply. You can also find it on our website. Next slide, please. We also have internship and practicum opportunities. Um, interns and practicum students get to be involved in every aspect of Squish's operations, craft their own projects, and be really intimately involved. We're gonna, not going to ask anyone to grab coffee or do work that you know typically interns do. Interns are actually very involved in our day-to-day -day operations and get to be in leadership positions and be really involved in our projects in a way that often bigger nonprofits or organizations are not able to offer. Next slide, please. Finally, what are some upcoming Squish projects and events in this year and the coming three years? So here's a sneak peek. The first uh, goal for this year is we're going to focus on recruiting and training our fifth class of peer counselors. We're also going to work on launching the Squishbook resource guide that consolidates information about St. Louis resources, hopefully launching it in a publicly accessible, searchable, community-owned database. And we want to use helpline called data findings to advocate for the community's needs in the systemic change piece that we mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, what does the Squishbook resource guide actually look like? And this is a demo site. Cleo, if you could click on it, we'd love to show you a little bit. It's a little bit like launching a beta product. Um, if you'll see here, there are right now 50 resources. We're continuously migrating resources from the spreadsheet in here. Every resources has really unique information that other resource guides typically leave out. Cleo, can you click on one to give an example? For example, you'll see the basic information like locations, contact information, hours, and links, as well as a general description. But we're also going to be including information like population served, location served, whether they have any identity affirming policies, and any accessibility factors that are important. So for example, St. Louis Zoo, um, you'll see that accessibility factors like whether they're COVID guidelines, do it 
is there any cost for attending? Do they have any interpretation or availability? Is the wheelchair accessible? These are all information we're gonna include and vet for in our resource guide. And usually this is information not included in um, other identity neutral, ident non-identity specific resource guides. So we hope that this will revolutionize the way people think about resources and more seriously consider accessibility factors instead of assuming that um, a location or provider is open and accessible to everyone. Do you have any thoughts or questions about the Squish book that Cleo is demoing for us right now? Have you seen anything like it before? Does it remind you of Yelp, perhaps? Is it, is it kept up to date and how is that done? Great question. Um, we have a team of volunteers and staff who we do our best to keep it up to date, but we also invite people to claim their listings so that people are invested in updating their own listings. For example, if a service provider had their entry in here, we will remind them every year to update it if there's any outdated information. We also currently are in the process of moving this from our current spreadsheet to this database. And part of that process is that we're going to have folks checking on the website, making sure the information that we're transferring is up to date. And I do believe we have some um, students taking on a project of actually calling and vetting some of these folks. Yeah, great question, Sean. Uh, I just want to you. say, I think that's a really great uh, database that would also be very beneficial to other uh, groups, such as the homeless drink uh, came to mind. Mm -hmm. um, and sharing it, uh, I think sharing it with everyone is, is a great thing, just because it's, it has such a, a thorough collection of everything. It would be beneficial to, to everyone. Absolutely, Ethan, that's a great point. And um, housing resources are some of both one of the most robust sections in the Squish book and the most needed resources in St. Louis. So you're definitely right that um, the in-house population is impacted by the way we create, design, and publicize this resource guide. Next slide, Cleo. Um, we just want to put out a call here that we're doing focus groups later this year to pilot test this resource database. Um, so if you're interested, you'll be compensated at a rate of $16 per hour, and you can subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on when the focus groups are launched. At the focus groups, we'll basically treat you to food and drinks and ask you to use the Squish book and see what you think. Do you have any feedback for how we can improve it? Is it user-friendly? And can you find what you're looking for? Next slide, Cleo. So let's skip this project and go right to the contact information. Um, this is it, y'all. If you support the work we do, get in touch with us. Uh, we are available on our website, uh, social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Snapchat, not so much. Um, we have a newsletter at tinyurl.com slash squish list that you can subscribe to. We also have a wish list because we're crowdfunding for office equipment. So if you have any extra lamps, computers, keyboards, mouse, or other things that um, fit into the category of office equipment, we're actively needing that for our office. Um, so let us know if you are interested in donating that. Next slide, Cleo. More traditionally, we also have other donation opportunities, including through Facebook, Venmo, PayPal, um, Cash App, and all of the links are on our website. We have a monthly donor program called Squish Stars, where we encourage folks to provide us with a sustainable source of funding. Um, next slide, Cleo. And it's at giftbutter.com slash squishstars. Um, monthly donors get special rewards, including a postcard, a shout out in the newsletter, um, special merchandise and event discounts, and other uh, perks. Next slide, Cleo. That's it. We uh, have three staff members right now. That's me, Cleo, and Jet, who's not here today. We all use they, them pronouns. Uh, you can find our contact emails at our first name, dot last name initial at the squish.org. That's all we've got, Cleo. Next slide, I think it's just Q&A. And we also encourage folks to fill out a feedback survey to let us know how we did today and let us know what your feedback is. It only takes five minutes and I'll drop it in the chat. Back to you, Erica, or we also have time to take questions. Yeah, does anyone have any other questions to ask? That was amazing. 
Thank you, Erica. Much appreciated. Um, maybe let's Whoa. go around the room and see if folks have questions. Absolutely, let's do. Thank you both for coming tonight. I so appreciate it. Thank you everyone for coming. Let's go around the horn. So maybe Becky, Owen, Sean, any questions, comments? Um, I appreciate your time and effort and the work that you do. Um, I don't really have any questions, but um, I do appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Becky, Owen, Ethan, Lisa. I just thought it was uh, really informative and I feel like I learned a lot uh, today and I'm excited to pass this resource on to people that uh, are interested in or need it. Absolutely. Thank you, Ethan. Doing really important awareness work. I do have a question for you. Erica. So what what are some um, some good words for someone who's maybe a parent who comes to you and says, my child is transitioning and I have no idea, or my child wants to transition and I, I, I am lost? Hmm. Wow, that's such a big and good question, Erica. I think as with anyone who is trying to support a loved one who is queer or transitioning, um, I think there's the piece of how are you processing it yourself and coping with it. I think often parents go through a lot of grief, loss, and bewilderment when their children are transitioning. They often mourn the loss of the child they thought they knew or had or had a close relationship to and feel like the child is transitioning to someone that they barely know or a new person. Um, of course, there are some misconceptions here and that a lot of the feelings you know, are valid and parents have such complex relationships with their children often. So I would encourage them to call Squish's helpline to process through those personal feelings, um, especially so that they're not obstructing the way they are wanting to support their child. Um, I've seen parents go through like divorce or custody battles because one is supporting their child's transition and the other person isn't. Um, so I think for parents who want to support their trans children, taking care of themselves and processing their own feelings is really important. And then the other piece about supporting their child might involve looking up resources, providing non-judgmental space, giving them room to explore what they want, um, which trans children often don't get the space to do. Maybe also giving them the space to explore different pronouns or names. They might go through different names until they settle on one that they like or go through different pronouns. I think often parents put a lot of pressure on trans children to figure out really soon or like be really sure about who they are and what, what name or pronouns they want to go by, which can actually be uh, put a really huge mental health pressure on um, the child to figure it out. Cleo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as if someone called the line while I was taking a shift and they said, my child is coming out, I'm at a loss of what to do. I think there are two avenues I would like to explore here. Um, Luke, I guess three, Luca mentioned one, which is how are you doing? Uh, and then the second one is how can you support your child's transition? And then how can you in general support your child? Um, so talking someone through, I imagine if the person was comfortable, um, I think a, a role play, it might be something that I would bring up on the line of like, okay, let's prepare for a conversation that you're going to have with your child. Um, I think some basic peer counseling skills, like asking questions, um, allowing basically how can you have a conversation with your child about their identity and what they're, um, who they're hoping to grow to be, who they are, um, what they would like to try, and then looking for how can we get connected with resources once you've had that conversation um, about how you can best support them? I think a lot of people would want to jump to resources and say, awesome, okay, so your child is trans. So Barnes Jewish has a medical center for um, PD, like a pediatric trans medical center. Here's their information when maybe that's not what the child wants and making sure that you can talk to the child about what their preference is and then figure out what it's from there. Erica, does that help? I know we just threw a ton of advice at you. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. That was outstanding. Thank you very much. Yeah, also, I think maybe telling them to call Squish. I don't know. <laughs> First and foremost. Um, Becky, Lisa, Ethan, Sean, any last thoughts or questions before we log off? Okay, then thank you all so much for your time today. Erica, maybe we can stop the recording here and can you maybe close us out?
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate everyone being here. The recording has